And then he explained he was wrong because this scholar and this expert said that the other things that debunked his statement, to be honest, he couldn't tell you what he said that day. He just remembered thinking, well, it sounded good. So the professor paused for a couple of moments and said, well, the majority of scholars agree with me. That was his favorite phrase of it. And we're off and running. Every time he'd attacked the Bible, my friend had a ready response. Then it came time for midterms and he sat down to take the test. At the bottom of the test he wrote that he was sorry to have challenged him so much in class. But he'd been attacking something that was important to him. He promised he'd never interrupt his lessons again. Because he was going on to Islam and he frankly didn't care about Islam. He was done with that professor, but God wasn't. In the next class, this is roughly what he said. Islam got him to black Muslims and got him to racial prejudice, and racial prejudice got him to World War II. Then he said, the reason we dropped the bomb on Japan and not the Germans was because the Germans were white and the Japanese were not. Now he's kind of a history buff. And that didn't sound quite right at all. But he made a promise he wouldn't cause any more trouble in the class. So he just kept his mouth shut. But people tell him that when he's frustrated, he gets and lets out a sigh. He must have sighed at the point where, because the teacher looked right at him and said, all right, Barnes, what's wrong now? He hadn't said anything, but since he asked, he returned from everything he'd ever heard. We didn't have the bomb when Germany surrendered. He responded, we did too, we had it in 1942. You need to understand this was the era of the war of Vietnam. And the government lied about all kinds of things back then. He figured, well, maybe they lied about this too. Then he just kind of slumped at his desk, defeated. And that's when God nailed him. One row back, and about four seats over, a young woman raised her hand. She said, I'm sorry, sir, but you're wrong. My father worked on that project, and we didn't have the bomb when Germany surrendered. So the point was this. My friend actually won, but not because he was clever or smart. He won because God was strong. He won because God fought for him and set his professor up to be exposed as a false teacher in front of an entire class, who probably thought he was nothing more than a nuisance. He wanted to close with an intriguing article he once read called The Begin Bringing a Tent Peg to a Sword Fight by Andrew Wilson and Christianity in May of 19, 2019. The battle against the Seer by Deborah Van Barrick has won, not with a sword, but a peg and a workman's hand, Judges 5.26. A woman drove a tent peg through the temple of the sleeping Sierra. Then the author told of an Old Testament battle in the book of Judges. Shemagar defeated the Philistines with a cattle prod. 331. Gideon won among the Midianites with jars and trumpets. The Philistine king, Amalek, is killed by a millstone thrown over a wall. Then in Exodus, Moses brings the Israelites out of Egypt using a staff that's designed to steer sheep. The book of Joshua tells of Jericho walls that were brought down with musical instruments. They blew trumpets. So God, he wrote, seems to be like commonplace tools. The stuff of cooking, building, farming, culture, but not swords or spears or chariots. It's the very strangeness of the weapons that's the point. Nobody could win a fight with those kinds of weapons, right? unless God was with them. It could be a tent peg or a cattle prod. It could be a job on a pebble, a stone, an altar soaked in water that suddenly caught fire. Whatever the means of victory, it rams home the point that Israel's success came not by might nor by power, but 
my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah 4 6. So, in other words, their strength came from the Lord. And then the author added this interesting observation The ultimate contrast came at the cross. Rome, the most powerful military force in the world, had never had a that they'd never seen, gathered a battalion of soldiers to inspect the Israel's king. They were warned, they were armed, they stripped him, they came with swords and spears, he came with nothing at all but the name of the Lord God. They carried the most advanced weapons available. He carried nothing but a rugged cross and a crown of thorns. And yet when the dust settled, the soldiers were no match for the king of kings. Jesus won the battle for our souls, not by weapons of this world, but with his blood on the cross. I want to close by revisiting the words from Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint nor grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, young men shall fall faint, exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Notice the reason that we can trust God to give us strength is because he can. He has the power and the wisdom beyond anything we can even imagine. He is the creator. He is the everlasting God. He does not faint or grow weary because he's God. And he loves you so much, he wants to share that power with you. Amen. We have shared our offerings as we enter. Let's praise the Lord.
We pray for the world around us. Or where there's war and takeover and persecution. May you soften hearts and help people live together in peace. Where there is tragedy from the storm, death of loved ones, comfort bring to them, help them in rebuilding, renewing, and surviving. Be with those that are there to help as well. For Marty Jackson's family, for their memories, may they be comforted too. For Denise, as she has this MRI, that she would have some good results. For Jane and John recuperating, as well as Ellen, Dana, Tom, Bob and Joan, Peggy Norm, be with them and their special needs those that are helping. Those in assisted living, we pray for Renee, Carol and Jack, Jeannie, George, Joan, Etta, and Carolyn. We thank you that there is there is to help them and to make their lives comfortable. We pray for others that might be on our minds, for your guidance in our lives, for your presence near us, walking with us as we journey. We thank you for your love in, in Christ for the example that he gives us, for the love he has shown as well. Now hear us as we pray together as Jesus' disciples were taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is 326, Softly and Tenderly.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.